All right, as you can tell, we are back in Charles City, back at the Floyd County Museum, back in the tractor room, although this is not gonna be the main subject of this video since not a whole lot changes in here other than stuff gets moved around to get stuff closer or further away from the door depending on what needs to come out at that particular time. I don't see anything that's here that's different than what was here last time. But obviously we've got the corporate tractor that's kind of in the same state she was last time we saw her. Hopefully we can figure out a way to get him some money to get this thing a little bit further ahead of where it's at right now would be nice. If I could ever hear this, if I could hear this thing run in my lifetime, my life would be complete. Test sled. Ooh, except last time we were here, the doors weren't open. This thing is quite the monstrosity. And I'm sure when they were actually, actually using it, there was probably even more gauges and instruments and whatever, depending on the tests they were doing. I'm, there were probably even more in it than what's in it now. What does that sign say? Looks like it's, oh, it's just some math formulas for stuff. But we're just gonna do a quick run through here real quick and then uh, we're gonna go get a private tour of the archive room, which I've never been in and I didn't even know that they would let you in until a, uh, gentleman that i've been working with on this particular trip told me hey if you uh if you ask them they'll take you through so if you want a full if you want a better walk through this room you can go back to the trip from last year that's the second high compression experimental engine out of the uh, xo121 moline a4t 1900 experimental power shift picture of the Charles City plant it is all gone now last time we were here we uh, when Al walked us around we started off we were standing and we stopped right about here north of the railroad station and walked across the tracks and we're looking at this area and then we came and stopped at this intersection and we're looking back through this area but it's all gone now I'm hoping I can if I'm hoping somebody knows who owns this chunk of property because the test track is still there it's all it's all grown up with trees now but it is still there and if I could figure out who owns the property I'd like to get permission to walk back on there and see that see what's left of the test track it's just a concrete oval now but better to document it now before it's gone than to have it gone forever Shelly's all excited about this <laughs> The famous XO121. She was on a show tour. I it was last summer or the summer before last. And then last time we did this trip, one of the one of the guys that came to the the get together, um, he was the guy that uh, was the um, uh, one of the plant maintenance operator workers who almost uh, killed that manager in the wheel of braider because he walked in behind him after he closed the door. But that's the guy that built this thing. It runs, it works, it's fully functional. It's a uh, half scale model of heart part number one. So that is your quick walk around of the tractor room. And now I guess we'll go meet up with the curator and go see the the stuff that nobody gets to see. Is kept. So this is the vault. This is the upstairs area, and then downstairs there's a tractor archive room, which I'll show you later. It has 
lots more things. So this room is notable because it has all the manuals. See here, they are organized by publication number. Uh, those are all over publication number. Over here is Minneapolis Moline, over there is White, and on the far side is Clee Track and Hart Par and the other kind of miscellaneous ones. Um, and if ever we want to make a copy of the manual, we well, that's a bad example. Uh, we come in here and we look for the publication number. Here's S442, a uh, brand drill. We take that out, take it as a copier, run it through, and then put it back in here when we're done. Um, so you've got all the manuals crammed in here? Uh, yes. Or just the... All the manuals that we have are in here. Now, there are some manuals all over published that we just don't have, but I don't think there are a whole lot of those. And the uh, online list that you have, that's a complete list now, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. So you can go online... Search is that searchable by publication number or you just yes. search that by model number? Well, it's just a PDF. So you can press control F and search it by whatever you want. And then it looked like you guys heard it had Oliver obviously Oliver uh Oliver and White, it looks like you had some Moline stuff. Mm -hmm. Somehow this looks like you ended up with some Alice Chalmers stuff of all weird things. Yes, yeah, I just stuff I found. So I made that list and I went through these hands have touched every manual in this building. And I, I went through just drawer by drawer because we there's lists before I got here. But it was some kind of hodgepodge thing that was inherited from a decade ago, and nobody knows who made it, and it was incomplete. There were things that we had that were not in the list, so I just went through, one by one, everything. There's an article in uh, one of the HPOCA magazines about it. I forget which one. Speaking of HPOCA, uh, those guys, a few of them, John Schoenauer and others, came, and they're the ones who organized the stuff on top of these filing cabinets into these boxes. Previously, it was all just piled up, and they, they put it into categories. Now it's much easier to find um over here this is just sort of lots of miscellaneous stuff there are photographs um sales literature uh, artifacts like the stuff on top of the shelf there those um like uh, there's a time punch clock there stuff like that uh there's some more manuals that are just sort of unusual over here which i had to look at uh, in the late 40s i think all of our manuals for some reason looked a bit like that they were that format so we had to get these special plastic bags and put them in this box so m most of the photographs and stuff you see the guys have researched for books and stuff that's where most of this stuff is is in here i would assume i don't know most of that was done before i got here so i couldn't tell you but i i don't know where else they would get the photographs <laughs> um yeah we have boxes of slides just tons of stuff it's also kind of disorganized this room looks a lot better now than it did a few years ago every once in a while we come in here and decide okay now we're gonna just sort all this out and like, for example, this, this shelf looks much tidier now. It used to have just things piled up all over it. I put them in these drawers. These are the, the Red Tractor books uh, that INT published for I think 50 years or so. So these, this is from 1938 to 1963. Hmm. And then, um, yeah, the Tractor Field book, 1930, 1958, INT product files. Oh, we Nebraska test stuff there. Uh, we have a bunch of UAW stuff here from the factory. There's tons and tons of stuff. This room is difficult to use sometimes because we don't know what all we have or where it is or how to find it, but we're piecing it together bit by bit and we'll eventually have it all sorted. Uh, let's see. Yeah, they're just weird things like this. Uh, this is funny. So this is a bottle of wine from White. They had some kind of party or something, uh, 1985. Huh. This, is just, this is just left over. And from what, because dad, mom and dad were here two years ago before the first time I came here and they spent a lot of time talking to you and the way he, wait, what, from what he told me, you were basically hired on here and kind of your main thing was to clean up the mess. Yes. Yes. The basement. Organize the mess. The basement, I'll show you later. It looked very much like the TV show hoarders. <laughs> Just piles of stuff with a little path you could walk through. Uh, and a lot of it was the tractor stuff too that had to all be put into order. And it, it's kind of a, an endless project because there's, there's always more. And uh, when we get to the tractor archive room too, I'll show you a certain donation we got from a certain somebody that uh, added to the pile quite considerably. Uh, but we appreciate it. Yeah, and when we want to do extra exhibits, for example, there in the tractor room was the um, behind the scenes at the Oliver plant case by the Minneapolis Moline stuff. Typically, just come in here and say, hmm, how about this? How about that? And because there's just so much stuff in here, it's pretty easy to find new stuff that people haven't seen before. And seeing those videotapes reminds me, there were some guys who wanted me to ask you, do you guys have any um, Oliver White Farm equipment 
like sales videos that can be bought or has that those not got transferred to digital uh, yet? Good question. So you point those out. I have digitized all of those and these cassette tapes, these audio I've done also. We have a lot more videotapes upstairs that digitized. And then the, um, the 16 and eight millimeter film was sent to uh, Des Moines to be digitized. That's being done right now. Um, so is it available for purchase at the moment? No. However, we do plan this year to get that going. Once the stuff from um, Des Moines comes back and we have it all organized, I can burn DVDs here at the museum. I can also digitize VHS tapes and cassettes. And we do have all of our uh, videos, movies um, from White also. Uh, but a lot of times the original, for Oliver, the original format was film. Mm -hmm. And so that's going to be from Des Moines. But for White, a lot of it was originally, well, originally VHS, some of it's Betamax, which I cannot digitize. That has to be sent away. Um, but anyway, that stuff all, what we hopefully, we on the website will have some kind of page where you can look at all the stuff we have. And then you can say, I want this, 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 and then place an order. And, and then I can, uh, we would sell you DVDs. Mm -hmm. I'd burn it to a DVD and we send it to you in the mail. I know there's a, there's a lot of people that want, because there's several, obviously John Deere, you can go right to John Deere and get that stuff through the Two Cylinder Club, and I think right through John Deere Archives. And there's a guy guy online kind of doing the all, all the Alice Chalmers stuff he could find. There's not a whole lot. I've managed to pick up a few VHSs at auctions and stuff and got those digitized and put them on my channel. But as far as Oliver and White stuff, it's basically non-existent. So I know there's a lot of guys kind of hungry for that. So Yes, that's it's a big project, but I think it's, it's, it's getting pretty close to being uh, uh, productive. So that'll be pretty sweet. Mm -hmm. So that answers that question for everybody. Yes. I'm sure there are lots more things I could talk about. I just aren't occurring to me at the moment. Well, any anything you see you have questions about? Oh, we, if, if I really wanted to ask questions, we could probably stay in this room all day. But <laughs> Yes, probably. That's true. So I guess we can go on to the, the next one. Okay, cool. We'll go to the room next door, actually, before we go to the basement. Because this is something I want people to see. So over here is the manual room. Now... The, uh, the masonry of this building is getting kind of bad, so this room's pretty cold. Uh, the cold air gets in from outside. We need to have that tuck pointing done. But anyway, uh, this is the manual room. It's where we keep the manuals which are for sale. So all of these manuals and all of these uh, shelves here are, like I just pulled this one out, whatever. They're, they're all original manuals that you can buy. And on our list, we can see which ones we have original manuals for and which ones we don't. So whenever you call, we'll tell you, oh, we have an original one for that. And sometimes, not sometimes, quite often, Guys will call and say, I just want a build card. And I say, but we do have an original manual for that. Oh, well, actually, in that case, then I'll take that. Uh, so people really like that, I know. Uh, although this is all left over from, not all, mostly, left over from the factory when it closed in 1993. And um, mostly the stuff they had tons of leftover manuals for was the stuff people didn't really buy. Mm -hmm. We have, in the basement, I'll show you, we have stacks and stacks and stacks of 1265 parts books. I can guarantee you we have more 1265 parts books than there are 1265s on Earth. That 100%. Yep. And then uh, we have, there's not just, so most of the original manuals that are the, the preservation copies are in the vault. However, some of them are in here because there's not enough space in there. This is all the cock shut stuff. And this, uh, these cabinets were a disaster. All these things are just shoved in here randomly, miscellaneous when I started. I got them all organized. I made these files. Now they're organized chronologically by model. So if you want a cock shut 240 cultivator operator's manual from 1951, there it is. Uh, our cock shut orders are not frequent. Well, you would be surprised how many people don't know that this place exists and don't even think to call here about books and stuff. So oh, yeah. hopefully we can help some of that out. Plus, mostly cock shut's going to be in Canada. Right. Canada, they probably don't think about calling down here anyhow, so. Yeah, but we can send it to through the mail. And then uh, here is New Idea. So in the 80s, White and New Idea were merged. And this is all original New Idea manuals from the 1980s, White and New Idea. It's actually, there's a little teensy weensy bit of pre-1980s New Idea stuff, a, a little bit from the 50s, but it's mostly all... Uh, Newer stuff. Yeah, from, from the era when it was uh, here in Charles City. I'm actually surprised Agco, or 
Yeah, I guess it'd be Agco. I'm surprised they let you take that because technically that falls under the Agco umbrella now. Well, yes, Agco is. Uh, yeah, we we we're not fans of Agco. <laughs> They're not. We we haven't had a good relationship with them. Uh, this so this is sales literature that is for sale because we have just so many copies of it. I mean, a lot of it's still in the plastic. You can see. If I can just take this out. What is this? 273, 274 disc Harrow. I mean, we still have so many of those. We we take this to shows. Actually, uh, McKenna went to the Minneapolis Moline Winter Show in Laverne, Minnesota the other week, and she brought a whole bunch of Minneapolis Moline stuff. Um, that's all mostly on this side, and she sold a lot of it. And so we have sales literature that's for sale. So if if people want to know about something, the best thing is just to call and ask about it, uh, because there's not really. I mean. We could put all this online and say, here's all the original stuff that we have, but it would be a rather cumbersome list that would be kind of hard to look through. And so if you just ask, do you have this? I can tell you on the phone, yes or no. That's a lot easier. Um, we also have stuff for the smaller brands people might not be as familiar with, like BG or Farquhar or uh, Aspenwall, maybe you've never heard of. Never heard of that one. I've, yeah. heard, I've heard of AB Farquhar and I've heard of BG, so. Yeah, so we, we have manuals and sales literature for that stuff also. Basically anything that's in the pedigree of white farm equipment. All the stuff that went into that, we have probably something for. Uh, if you go really far back, like Nichols and Shepard, Red River Special, it's going to get kind of iffy. But for the most part, we have pretty much anything you want. Hmm. I guess I didn't know that you went that far back and you branched that far out, so that's good to know. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, I think also people have just donated stuff, knowing that this is kind of the repository for that. So a lot of it came from the factory, and I think a lot of it also just came from miscellaneous people all over everywhere saying, hey, I just... For example, um, uh, when dealerships close or there's there's an old dealership that's been sitting empty for, well, empty, for 20 years and it, it gets bought and cleared out, it'll have stacks and stacks of manuals and parts and who knows what. And they'll call here and say, hey, you want these manuals we have? And we'll check our list. And if we don't have it yet, absolutely, yes, we'll take it. Hmm. Yeah. We also have over here... The, uh, now we don't use these books anymore because they're digitized, but these are the Minneapolis, oh, I'll get the original one, uh, this one, Minneapolis Moline ledger books. So Minneapolis Moline didn't do build cards. This was their record keeping for tractors. Um, so you can see this is a G950 LP, and there is the engine number, serial number, date of manufacture, and these tick marks all are options the tractor had, and we have code sheets that tell us what this all means. So each one of these pages is a tractor? No. Or... Each, each line is one tractor. Oh, okay. Yeah, and that's that's all the uh, record keeping that Minneapolis Millie did. This does not record shipment location, which is a point of consternation, but what can you do? And now we don't have to consult these, um, these physical books anymore because they're all scanned, which is good because they're very large and some of them are pretty heavy. All right, anyway, any questions? I think that, uh, that's a lot of books. <laughs> yeah, we have so much. I, I I would be perfectly happy if guys came here and like a kid in a candy store just walked into this room, ooh, I want that one, I want this one, I want that, and walked out with a pile full of them, fantastic. Oh, I'm, I'm sure if, if guys knew this was here, I'm sure that that would be exactly what would happen too. Yeah, that, that'd be fine. We're happy to sell them because they're just sitting here. They're, they're for sale. We're not doing anything with them. And then... Obviously, once you get down to a point where you only have one copy of it, that last copy gets saved for... Well, we already have one copy in the vault. Oh, in these so, drawers. okay. So yeah. the, these are the originals that are just going to go away, and that room over there is the ones that are saved for record keeping. Right, Gotcha, exactly. gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. And once they're gone, they're gone. Then you got a whole new room to play with. <laughs> yeah, well, this one's not going to be empty for a long time, I don't think. A 344 more. I don't even know if I've ever heard of one of those. Well, you can buy that. Now you've heard of it. <laughs> In fact, you can buy two copies. There's probably... I wonder if that was specific to the Super 44. That would make sense. But there's probably a lot of things in here that a lot of guys have never heard of. Oh, yeah. Especially once you get into the not Oliver lines, too. One guy, there was a cockshot collector who came here a couple months ago, and he was really interested in cockshot mowers. And so he was going through these filing cabinets. He was pulling out one example of every mower, the J, whatever they call it, I don't remember. And, and he wanted lots of copies made of it. And so he could do an article for the Cockshot magazine. <laughs> I mean, cool, great. I mean, we're happy to help. That's that's the sort of thing that we like to do because we want to make this stuff available to people. And a lot of guys don't know it's here. Or if they do know it's here, they don't quite understand, I think, 
just what they can do with it that they could just if they ask you can just walk into this room and i'll let you just take what you want you gotta pay for it but yes <laughs> all righty well i guess we can move on to the next one cool all right we'll go to the basement now all right so this is storage this is the tractor archive room this is the other area where we keep all of our oh wow yes so when I was hired, this room was a horrible mess. Then I cleaned it up, then it became a mess again. So all these blueprints are on this table right now because every Tuesday we have a team of five volunteers who have been coming here for years and they're just the best. Uh, but really though, they, um, they're going through all these blueprints, making a list of everything that we have. Because we have, I'll show you later, we have blueprints in microfilm. We, 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 those are all organized, we know what we have there. But we're pretty sure there's a discrepancy between what we have in big form and what we have in little form. And so the volunteers are going through all those big blueprints and make a big list that's going to be tied to them we're going to have that on the website too that you can search just like the tractor manual list uh here is the the piece de resistance these are the build cards so they're organized by model and then serial number so this is super 55s so i'll just pull it out they're all they look like this um so on the back of these ones at the top there is the serial number then the engine number and that is the dealer code we don't have an index of those and i've been told that they changed rather frequently and so even if you knew what dealer this came oops well i lost the place that's okay it's a serial number um even if you knew what dealer it came from still that wouldn't really help you because that code might have been for one dealer one year one dealer for next year uh that's where it was sent to and that's the date of manufacture that's the date of shipment normally those two are the same and not always and i don't know what that is 170 Often there are just other things written on there that we just can't figure out. And now I gotta put this back where it was. Two, three, zero, one, zero. Two, three, zero, one, zero, and one, one, there we go. All right, and then we also have uh, build cards for crawlers that were manufactured in Charles City. That would be the super, not super, that would be the, um, Oh, the crawlers. Uh, Probably the OC6, the OC4. Yes, the f 6. OC46. 46, 46 and... Uh, uh, OC12, OC9. It, yeah, it's the uh, 4s, 46s, 9s, and 96s. Yep. That's what we have. Uh, we have build cards for those, although they're, these cards are not... They're different and they're not as useful, so I'll take one of those out and not lose its place. So these ones just have it stamped all over the back. Oh, that's different. Yeah, they're not punched. At least they give you the destination, though. They do. Clearly. Yep. So if you have one of those crawlers, we can get you a build card for it, but only the crawlers that were manufactured in Charles City. So that's not a huge range of them. That's why this uh, box is not all that big. Yeah, they, they weren't built here very long, and they didn't build that very many of them here to begin with. So. Right. Um, also, for the Fiat stuff, we do have some information. So here you see 1250, 1255, 65, 1355. Uh, for those cards... We do have, they are punched, but we don't, they don't have as much information on them. You can see there are just a lot, of, a lot of zeros, a lot of blanks on there. So they don't record quite as much information. However, for the, the other Fiat stuff, we have what are called defect reports. They're in this cabinet. So the defect report for all of our Fiat tractors. For these models, 1265, 1365, and so on, and they look like this. So the trackers are manufactured in Italy, and then they were sent to Charles City to be inspected for defects. And if your tractor had defects, and apparently most of them did, um, they got a card like this. So if you have a Fiat built all over tractor, you might be able to get a defect report like this, which gives you some information. And there's nothing on the back. That'd be neat. I didn't even know those existed. Yeah, most people don't. So I'm glad you're making this video. Uh, now, this is not for all of them, because if your tractor was just good, had no problems, then it didn't get a report like this. Uh, we also have... Yeah, the door is closed. Uh, we also have... Now, this will never sell. These are quality reports, that's what QLT means. Uh, all these green boxes are actually from Hartpar. They were in the Hartpar factory, then Oliver used them, then White used them. Um, anyway, these are transaxles. So in 1988, they quit manufacturing tractors completely in Charles City. However, a lot of the parts for tractors were still made. And the transaxles, for some reason, got their own serial numbers, and we have their quality reports. I highly doubt we're ever gonna sell one of those, but we do have them available. What would be most interesting for people is, okay, here. Box eight. So this is where the white quality reports begin. So with the build cards, uh, in 1975, the brands were combined into be just white farm equipment. And 
they kept doing the IBM punch card system until 1982. But that gap from 75 to 82, we don't have. Agco retained those cards and they still have them somewhere. Um, however, after 1982, White switched to a different system called Quality Reports, and we do have those. So here's what they look like. So there is the serial number of the tractor, and uh, it's a date. These are rather different. So that's 2180. One, a 2180. And it's the same sort of information, it's just a packet of papers. Like a, a computer printout telling you what options it had. A lot easier to read than a build card. Yes, yes. You don't need a code sheet. So that's that cool to know, too. Mm -hmm. I just wish you had them for the in-between years, because yes. I'd like to have one for my 4150, but you don't have that. No. So so many guys, we get calls pretty frequently of guys saying, hey, I get, you got to build information from my white tractor? And I say, yes, but no. Uh, we also have them for, I bet most people don't miss, for the Iseki tractors. So it's the same sort of thing. These were manufactured in Japan, and then they were sent to Charles City to be inspected, except unlike the Fiat ones, every tractor got a card. And so if you have, uh, now that's an Iseki serial number. If you have one of those, some of the low horsepower tractors, we have building information for that too. Nobody knows about that. Yeah, no, I guarantee you. Yeah. Uh, we tried to publicize that, but guys, it's, it's just really hard to sort of get the information out. Um, a lot of these boxes, are there. this is a, a volunteer project that we need to have happen, are full of just stuff that came to the museum in 1993 when the factory closed. Or maybe 95 when it was demolished, I'm not sure, or around about that time. And they're still full of the same stuff they were full at that time. And it's we don't even know what's in it. Like this is, what is this? I don't know what these numbers written on these folders mean. I don't know what's in them. Process master sheet. Uh, something for manufacturing looks like. Um, anyway, we would really like there to be people who would come to the museum and just go through all these files and look at all these papers and tell us what's there. Because we don't even know what we have. It could be really cool stuff that would be useful to know, but there's just so much of it. And we at the museum don't, I don't really have any idea what that is. I can't tell you. So I, don't, I can't make heads or tails of it. <clears throat> um, the guys that work with this stuff every day and knew what it meant are mostly not around anymore. Yeah, that's the unfortunate part. Yeah, so right. we have a lot of difficulty um, knowing what to do with this stuff. What else do we have? Oh, so we have engine test sheets and some more of the boxes over there. So these, so for for some reason, for the G1355s, we don't have any build information. That's around the time that um, the Hopkins factory was closed and it was transferred to Charles City. But we do have engine test sheets because those engines were manufactured here. And that is the same sort of quality report thing. So that's the model of engine. And we actually have this um, on the website. You can see what engine test reports we have. And it's, it's the same sort of thing, a packet of papers. And there's an inspection report. This is a defect report like with the Fiat tractors, except it's also with the papers like with the quality reports. And those are found by engine serial number or tractor serial number? Engine, engine serial engine number. Engine serial number. Yes. We also have, so INV is invoices. We also have tons and tons and tons and tons and tons of invoices uh, from dealers for uh, various implements and tractors and things. We don't know what we have, but a lot of guys want to know what dealership was my tractor sent to, where did it come from, that sort of thing. And we have just kind of whatever random miscellaneous stuff was lying around when this stuff came to the museum. So we have some of that information, but we just... We don't know what you got. We don't know because there's so much of it. And we just never, it, it would take us... I mean, how many thousands of hours to go through all these boxes and look at all these invoices and see, I guess I should take one out and show it to you and see what we have. Uh, let me get a, a nice representative one. Uh, like that. That looks like it's not for a dealership. Maybe it's for uh, within the company. Rural farm delivery. Oh no, Avon Farm Supply up there at the top. There it is. Oh. Even yep, Illinois. right there. Yep. So, yeah. May, May 79. Delivery report. Is that just a single page? or? Uh, no, it's stapled there more. You can take it. This is cool. Oh, yeah. We have tons of stuff. 4150. Like I'll be dang. With a serial number. Yep. So, we probably have a lot more information than we're aware of, but we just... It's a matter of going through all these files and it includes spending the time for it. I don't know why, but that just sent a chill down my spine. <laughs> <laughs> if you could get these things figured out, that could open up a whole new world of where my equipment came, of you know where where stuff went. Oh, yeah. where, 
we what we really need is just volunteers. We need people who are willing to come to the museum and spend a very large amount of time uh, going through all this stuff, putting it in files, cataloging it, typing it into a computer, making a list of it so we know what we have, and then we can make it available to people who are interested. And this is not really going back in there. Well, it doesn't matter. Ah, yeah, anyway, uh, so all these boxes on top of here, I mentioned this in the vaults of the large donation we got. Dwayne Starr came with his wife, and they donated all the slides that Dwayne had. Dwayne has so much stuff. So, so much. much stuff. Yes. And so all these boxes came all at once, all these cardboard boxes, and they're full of nothing but slides. All this came from him? All this came from him. He, he came with his uh, pickup truck, just completely filled with slides. Slides, slides, slides. These came from him, too, in the same donation. And here I can show you the sort of thing we donated without opening a, um, a box. And it, it looks like this. And they're just, these are mostly from service schools. So it's illustrating particular parts and how to, you know. Yeah, and no, on further, it's probably a script that went along with them. Yep. Uh, I, some of them actually come with uh, pages. Well, with that, it, it, they come with a script. Uh, he gave us a projector too, in case we want to display them ever. Um, these files here are the blueprints. Uh, we actually have some Minneapolis Moline blueprints over there, I'll show you. Uh, so we, we get orders for blueprints a lot of the time, they're $15 a piece, and these are all microfilm. And so they're organized by part number. It's very hit and miss. We have a lot of them, we don't have all of them. So people, you, got, you just have to call and ask and say, do you have this, do you have that, and I'll tell you yes or no. But I have a machine in my office which can make this microfilm big, but it looks, I can hold up to the light maybe, looks like that. I don't know how well it's gonna show up on YouTube. And we, I mean, there, there's one guy, Bill Martinson. He, uh, he gets blueprints from us every month. And just every, every once in a while, I send an email saying, I want these ones, these ones, these ones, these ones. And I'll tell him, yay or nay, we got them. And I'll send them to him and he'll send us a check. And then um, we also have, oh goodness. Yeah, 2150, 2255, 2655 we have. Um, maybe you guys didn't realize we have this. These would be the uh, A4Ts. So those are uh, Minneapolis Moline serial numbers. And so, oh, that one was sent to Guthrie, Oklahoma. And this, you can see though, is not really a, a build card exactly. It's some record of it, but not much. So it gives you data manufacturer, shipment location, some serial numbers, and that's about it. That and was but, probably the Oliver half of the record keeping and the Moline record, or the Moline half was probably the serial number and all that stuff yep. when it actually rolled off the line. Right. So I don't think we've ever sold one of those 2655 cards because people probably just don't know we have them. And you get into those crossover models, you're like, okay, so is it going to have Oliver information on it or is it going to have Moline information on it? You never really know. So yeah, it gets, that's one of them questions that you need to ask. Yeah, it gets pretty confusing. Um, and with Moline blueprints, we have them here. Now, with the Minneapolis Moline stuff, it's really hit and miss with the blueprints. We have a lot of them, but not all of them. Some of them maybe, yes and no. But anyway, it's the same sort of thing. It's just uh, the cards like that with the microfilm. And so give, give me a Minneapolis Moline part number. I might be able to... And the Moline stuff probably doesn't go pat or go back pre-white merger. So no, it's going to be anything after 62. Yeah, exactly. So that's not as useful, but it's there. Uh, these are all of the HPOCA back issues that we sell. They're $6 a piece. Uh, we have them going back all the way to when HBOCA began. And then Minneapolis Moline gave us some magazines too we can just distribute for free at events or something. Um, over here, so these are all blueprints. So this is what the volunteers are doing right now. You see the list, they're just going through all these. Now, um, I was told uh, in 2020, when the previous director retired and a new one was hired, uh, uh, these were all just on the floor. These cabinets, not cabinets, these racks did not exist. So the racks were built and then these were put on them. And I'm told apparently at the time, they did make a list of what all was on each rack, but that list disappeared. It went the way of the dodo. We do not know what happened to it. Uh, so now we're having the volunteers go through again and make a new list that we will keep this time. Uh, but we have just so much stuff in here. Uh, this is blueprint, there's a little, piece of the ceiling, okay. Uh, there's blueprint paper here from the factory. We sell this in the gift shop, actually, because we just have stacks and stacks of it. And um, those are on display in the tractor room. I found these uh, on the floor face down in one of the rooms in the basement. They were on the bottoms of these um, uh, big uh, uh, wooden frames. And they were 
their plans for the uh, the building, the factory buildings. Huh. And uh, there were just chairs stacked on top of them. And these were face down. And th this basement, you might notice it looks kind of disgusting on the floor. It's all rotted and nasty. That's because in 2008, there was a flood in this building. And so actually this nastiness is not really from an almost century's worth of decay. It's just from that one year. Luckily, nothing got destroyed. Yes. Amazing, actually, nothing got destroyed. It's also why you see mostly there's not anything close to the ground. That, I guess, is an exception. For most of the shelving, we've put things a little higher up. Um, I don't know in 2008 exactly how everything was arranged in here, what it looked like. I don't know how much water got into this area. I know it was kind of different, but I mention it because you see all the water damage in these ones. These ones were face down in the worst flooded area of the basement. And so the, this one probably got just completely drenched and then dried out again. Anyway, that's now digitized. The, the county engineer actually is very accommodating. We take him large blueprints because we can't scan them here. And then he, uh, for free, will scan them for us to a USB stick. So we're, we're very thankful for that. But we also know we can't just bring him all those blueprints. Here are 500 blueprints. Please scan them. <laughs> so we got to be careful about that. Uh, here are more blueprints like what we have. This is what the volunteers are going through now. So, a bunch of Oliver stuff. Uh, we might have this in microfilm. We might not. We don't know. So we need to have a list of all this, what we have, and then we can uh, compare that to the uh, the cards over there. Oh, there's so much. Uh, oh yeah, we have Coxer blueprints too. I forgot about that. Over here is a bunch of Massey Ferguson stuff. Actually. That's odd. Yes, we do have a lot of Massey Ferguson. So this one says hold for MF four thousand. So. These are all, in these boxes here, Massey Ferguson blueprints. Um, How did those end up here? Who knows? <laughs> who knows? The mostly from Massey Ferguson combines. And we don't really know what we have. Again, the, the volunteers are going through these and just kind of organizing them and trying to figure out. Well, I guess that would kind of, well, I guess it wouldn't really make sense, though, because you guys didn't get a whole lot of stuff from the Brantford combine plant. Uh, uh, well, uh, we did, but we didn't. Uh, apropos, let's, let's go look at that stuff. That was the segue you planned, right? Well, you said mostly Massey Combine stuff, and that's the only thing I can think of how it got here. Somehow it got mixed in with the stuff coming from the cockshut plant in Brantford, because I thought, if I remember right, they were like dang near right across the road from each other, and they closed almost at the same time. Oh, I didn't know that. If, if I remember right. Okay. How, how that would explain how Massey Combine blueprints got here. Well, I think, I think they kind of played hopscotch over from factory to factory to factory before they eventually, for some reason, came to Charles City and then to this museum. Anyway, you'll see there's a lot of Coxshut stuff on this cabinet. This is mostly Coxshut stuff. Uh, it's also some reference books and engineers' handbooks and that kind of thing. Um, we don't know what's on the shelf. Like this, this is, these are building records for uh, that particular Coxshut harvester. Uh, I think it's just kind of a, similar to the Minneapolis Millennium thing, just giving you dates of manufacture. Uh, but we, another thing we would need volunteers to do is just look at all this stuff and tell us what's there and where it is and what it means. This is where I'd be really, because combine, I kind of got a soft spot for combines. I, I got four of them now. Oh. But there's hardly any information as far as like, there's, and actually I think Dwayne Starr's compiled most of it. I, um, there's some there's some serial number stuff available for like the 525, 545 that series that I think Dwayne did most of the work on and um, like 73 but there's really like there's no build cards there's no nothing to reference any of the harvester stuff that came from Battle Creek or Brantford yep. so if there's any of that in here that would be really interesting and there might be it's just we don't know I think this stuff is 25 combine so that would be most likely Battle Creek. I think they, I can't remember if the 25, I think the 25 was the last one to come out of Battle Creek. I don't know if they transferred the 25 over to Brantford in the move or not. Number 50, Tobacco Cutter, yep. or Tobacco Cultivator. Scufflers, yeah, we have manuals for Spring those. Tooth Harrows, Scotch Clip, never heard of one of them. Yeah, Cockshut gave their stuff kind of funny names in the 1920s and 30s, especially. They, one thing they had was called a kangaroo, something or other. Huh. So, if there's anybody, 
any any cockshut aficionado out there who wants to volunteer his time to look through this stuff, I would be very happy. Perkins Diesel manual. Well, it might be a manual or it might be something else in there just in a manual binder. Huh. Two one fifty five something or other. So much stuff. I know there's so much. I mean, you could just spend so many hours down here. Uh, this stuff here, also, we don't quite know what all is in here. It's I don't think it's terribly interesting stuff. Uh, it's mostly kind of computer printouts like this. Bill of material for um, something. I don't know. Sort of just a list of stuff for manufacturing. Engine. That's a bill of material for an HD 800 power unit. Huh? Big Moline LP. Okay. And where I've actually seen something like this before. Are you familiar? Well, actually, you probably are because you got an experimental transmission. The A14 1900 Moline. You got the experimental power shift transmission for one out here in the... Uh, oh, oh, yeah, the corporate tractor, you mean? No, not the nope. corporate tractor, the Moline four-wheel drive that was supposed to be the next step from the 2655. Oh. There was one... Um, Mike Volhurst, who was the lead engineer on the 2655 project, and one of the engineers on the 4150 project was also the engineer on the project for that A14-1900, which is that red power shift transmission you have sitting on the stand out there oh on the on the stand on the yep. wheels yes okay now we're talking about yes yes when we were at ran tool a few years ago um there was i can't remember if they found two if they found three or four of those transmissions like what you have out here but anyway they got one or they took two and made one working one and put together a working prototype a14 1900 mike volhurst and one of his friends did before mike passed away and dad and i got to talk to the guy down at rantoul and he had a book that looked exactly like that that was the pick parts list from the moline experimental department for all the parts to build the a14 1900 prototype so that is where something where those would probably get interesting is to see if any of those are pick lists for prototypes okay yeah something to look for why if anybody starts going through those oh yeah well again this is just more stuff that we don't know what we have we're not really sure what's in these so this is where you need to volunteer out exactly yeah this room we just need so much uh this this is around because it's kind of neat so this is the cover to a heart par manual but it has charles par signature on it no kidding yep i don't know what happened to the rest of the manual but this has been here for a while hmm yep that's just kind of neat i don't know why it's in that box it's, this is all just kind of looked that way ever since i was hired um so over here is the film. So we have it organized. Right now it's kind of in disarray, like in this box here, because um, we're waiting on the stuff from Des Moines to be sent back. But once that is back, we'll put it back into order. But this is all the film, 16 millimeter, eight millimeter, and then some other kind of weird formats. And we have it organized by title. And you see, we have so much of it. We have many, many copies of the same title. And so what we hope to do is sell some of the original film to people that want it, because we don't need six copies of the same film. So once we have it digitized, and then once we uh, have decided which ones we want to keep and which ones we want to get rid of, that's something we're thinking about. Not set in stone, though, so no promises. Um, down there at the bottom, that's that's the mystery pile. So on the right are clips. It's just lots of some very small snippets of film. We don't know what's on them because they're not labeled. On the left is just mystery. Whole reels of film that are just not labeled. It's like a black spine VHS tape. You don't know what's on it. So that stuff we'll have to send to Des Moines also just to be... But you're planning on getting all that stuff looked at eventually? Yeah, eventually, hopefully, yeah. It's also a matter of money because uh, this guy in Des Moines is to be paid. He, he's used to working in the hundreds of feet of film. He's not accustomed to working with miles of film. So we have to pay him for his time, and it's it, it gets up there. Yeah, also we have this, this cart full of stuff. All this stuff needs to be filed, looked at, put away. It's just a matter of hours. Oh, 412. Oh, this is going to be good stuff. 412 grinder mixer, 431 combine, 
three row corn. This is going to be good stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that that shelf is just kind of um, various products. These, because these don't have titles, have not gone to Des Moines yet. Only the ones with titles like progress or uh, you know a new move forward or whatever. Uh, those ones are digitized. These ones have to be a separate batch. OC ninety six OC four with Dan Hauser. I think that's a. I think that would be a dozer blade. OC six. Those are. Ooh, I'm I'm. OC four ski tractor. I've never even heard of that. I'm excited. Although, you guys are going to get a lot of my money. <laughs> well, so this this probably won't be digitized until next year. That's fine. That you're still going to get a lot of my money. All right, <laughs> we'll take it. And also, maybe tamper your expectations a little because this film was from the 1960s and 70s, and it's deteriorated somewhat. Sometimes the sound is really bad. Oh, guys, don't care. There's oh. there is, and there are. There are people that are really good. It, it may, and maybe your guy can point you to somebody if he can't. There are people out there that are really good at taking this old stuff and fixing the sound and fixing the color. And there, the technology to do that has come a long ways. And like the guy that does the Alice Chalmers stuff, uh, his channel's J and L Videos. He has done a lot of work, and he's he's talked about how he's had to fix audio and tweak color and stuff to put it back right. And it's 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 possible. It just yes, yes. It's a matter of time and money, right? I, that shelf, I think, is. I just saw one for a five forty planner, and now I lost it. Oh, that would be one of the uh, 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 whether the progress in farming shows, or whatever they're called. I forget. There, there is a long series of them. What's new and better farming? That's it. Yeah, there's 64 right there. That one doesn't have a year on it. Power to plows. Yeah. Power to plow 68. Power to plows another year. I'm guessing it's probably what all those are. Yeah, they're all copies of the same thing. Yeah, we have a bunch of copies of What's New and Better Farming 1969. We don't really need that many. So we'll probably get rid of some at some point. But we got to make that determination later. I'm excited for this. Yep. Yeah. I'm sure there's going to be a lot of guys excited for it once they find it out. Oh, yeah. I never in a million years figured there'd be, there'd be that many films left around, but... Oh, yeah. We got a lot of them. Huh. Yeah. So, anyway, any questions about stuff in here before we go to the next area? I didn't know there was a next area. There's a next area. There's a next area. There's a next area. <laughs> no questions? I think we're good for now. All right. What's well, on the other side of the basement? So we're going to have to take a little walk through some more darkness. This room, by the way, was a cafeteria back in 1933 when this place was constructed. So yeah, because for anybody that doesn't know, this was a meta or this was a vac vaccine lab for a uh, this, animal. It was Dr. Salisbury's laboratory. Yeah. So he made not just vaccines, but general animal medicine, mostly for poultry. And this was the research area and production facility. So in the basement, also, they made stuff there's actually i'll show you this is kind of fun it has nothing to do with the tractor stuff but since you're down here um there's actually a sump pump over here in this very frightening room so i think this light switch works yes it does so you see that pump there they would just dump stuff down the drain that goes to the sewer system it still works so whenever they're manufacturing stuff here we don't do that anymore um, they would have their effluent, and there it would go. And this room does not close properly, but oh well. Yeah, she's an old building. She probably sagged a little bit. Oh yeah, this is, uh, and again, a lot of this nastiness is just from 2008. So you, you'd be surprised that we see older pictures of the basement. It looked actually pretty clean and nice, even in the 1980s, 1990s. All right. Anyway, we have to go to the other side of the basement now. These doors are for sale, by the way. You like them. I wonder if any of them fit in the house. I don't know. Over here is a, uh, this is a steel glass door for that boiler room. So if you'd like, uh, that weighs a lot. I moved it there, I can tell you. Um, okay, so this is another area. These lights are new, by the way. They were installed last year. Uh, so here are more manuals. I'll try to get the light just a second. So these ones are on the list. 
There are markers being in the basement. Um, we have more stuff over here. Uh, over here is white and all over. Over there is Minneapolis Moline. These are just kind of the, this is the miscellaneous pile. If we have just one or two copies of something, it's not worth making a spot on a shelf for it, so it goes onto this kind of random pile. Come on, show me a picture. If you are what I think you are, I think I know where there's a real one at. No, maybe not. <laughs> Super 225 diesel power unit. There's lots of stuff um, over here. More stuff. These are all 1950T shop manuals. Original ones. Still with the paper band on them. Are those for sale? Yep. I might take one because I don't have one. <laughs> Please do. And then we have a bunch of combine stuff, more manuals. This room is fun. So remember I mentioned those 1265 parts books. All those, huh? Yep, those, so these are the main manuals and these colored ones are the supplements to them. So th these are all 1265. Those are probably all here because nobody wanted them even when they were new. <laughs> yeah, nobody wanted them. So we're probably gonna like use these for arts and crafts or something because nobody's ever gonna buy all these. Uh, but yeah, we got just tons and tons more manuals. If you see any, all these shelves, by the way, that look like this, the gray ones, I built them. All this stuff was on the floor when I was hired. I can't believe they did that. I mean, I guess I can understand why they did that, because when all this stuff showed up, it was just in semi-trailers, and they just had to yes. unload it, but still. Pallets. Pallets and pallets of it. That's, that's a, lot of, a lot of work and a lot of potential history to just lose to a possible flood. Yeah. Well, they weren't expecting 2008 to be the way it was. And this is the last area. So this is tons more manuals uh, for tractors, for combines. This Every time we take stuff to a show, we normally bring some of these because people like to buy these just for the binder. They mm -hmm. don't really care much for what's inside it. They just want to have the binder. So we sell these too. People like them. Um, yeah, this is all. Oh, these are more, I think, uh, 1950T shop manuals. I'm pretty sure. Yeah, so more 1950T shop manuals. I don't know why we have so many of those, but we have tons I don't of them. They probably didn't even build that many 1950Ts. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. We just we got lots. Um... Yeah, a lot of it's still wrapped in the plastic, like that one you see. Oh, 262 front loader. The stuff that's wrapped in plastic, you almost gotta buy two so you can have one that stays in the plastic and one you can use. Sure. <laughs> yep, the 1600 parts books up there, original ones. We got piles of those. Uh, what is this? Oh, combine. Yeah, it's mostly combine stuff in here. You guys have a lot more of the off-the-wall Moline stuff than I thought you would. Oh yeah, we just so much random stuff. And because I took the time, it took me about six to eight months to catalog all this, we have a list, so I can tell you whether we have it and where it is. Huh. What's that one? Field Boss 185. Field Boss 37. And the Iseki stuff's kind of hard to come by, so... Mm -hmm. It's kind of neat how they made those silver. Yeah. Huh. Well, if anybody needs any literature or manuals or basically anything... I guess we didn't get your name. Let's tell everybody what your name oh, is. I'm Scott Galliard. I work here at the Floyd County Museum at 500 Gilbert Street in Charles City, Iowa, 50616. Uh, you can also call us at 641-228-1099, and I can answer all of your questions. And if I can't answer it, I can probably find someone who can. And you guys are closed Mondays, right? Uh, yeah, closed Sunday, Monday. Uh, open to the public Wednesday through Saturday. On Tuesdays we are here, but just not open. So you'll, you'll you answer the phone on Tuesday. You just they, nobody can come in. Which right. if you're ordering manuals, isn't really that big of a deal. Right. So, but by all means, come to the museum because there's a lot of stuff here to see more than what we just showed you. Yes. Although nobody's ever seen, well, not say nobody, but not very many people have seen all the stuff that we just showed you. So now that everybody knows it's here, there's a lot of stuff here. <laughs> a lot, a lot, a lot of stuff here. Oh yeah, a lot. So we appreciate you 
taking us through this, and hopefully it'll uh, drum up a little bit of business for you. I, I it, hope cer so it certainly couldn't. It certainly isn't going to hurt. My God, the stuff. Moline Dan recently did a video where he said, "Here is a diesel injection book, um, publication number S two fourteen. Call the Floyd County Museum to get this." And then the same day, we got three or four calls. Hey, I want this book, S two fourteen. So yeah, these videos definitely do have an effect. So. Yeah, so if somebody calls you with a publication number, you can find it by that too, correct? I can, yep. So, yep, even if you don't have to, or if you don't want to go online and look up what they have, if you got a publication number, give that to them and he can get it for you. So and A lot of times also, guys don't know the model because it's not on the implement, if it's some kind of plow or something, um, then it's a little more difficult, but I can figure it out usually because if you just tell me the number of blades or discs or whatever, and then I can look at the sales literature and try to find the... The, the right uh, the right year and the right model something like that or you send me a picture of it so even if you don't know exactly the model the year or anything we can probably figure it out still all righty well thanks for showing us the uh the catacombs down here yes. and uh we'll uh keep on moving on i guess all right yep that's it no more tractor stuff to show well documents and different things from I don't know when this here. from the plant these drawers all have blueprints that are heart par vintage so it's blueprints old, for, old. yeah super old yeah 1919 19, mm -hmm. so and they're really thin and delicate so recently we got a grant from the heart par oliver foundation which is like the charitable organization associated with hpoca and we purchased a big scanner so we can start scanning these. So eventually we'll be able to um, to send copies of these blueprints to people right now. Because right now they're not organized in any way. Obviously they have like part numbers and stuff associated with them. But I think probably we have, we sh it's a lot of blueprints. So I could see someone making like a heart part tractor kind of from scratch if they really wanted to with the blueprints, you know, which I think would be neat. Or people who are making like... Reproduction know, parts yeah, and reproduction stuff. Yeah, reproduction or like you know, one sixteen scale models or whatever. So we have those. And that's a project, too, where we'll need volunteers and stuff to help us. Um, we also just have tons of other documentation in this room that we haven't even really looked at. And tons of um, negatives. We have all these slides over here. These are all just boxes of slides, and that's from the plant. Actually, a lot of the stuff that's in this room is from South Bend. Um, oh, no kidding. Yeah. So that's my anyway, that's like, I guess so, kind of. <laughs> um, and then we have like, oh, not negatives. <laughs> like, there were, yeah. Tons of negatives from Oliver. Hydraulic pump idler gear. You know, so these haven't been digitized in any way. But we also have, I mean, we've got tons more of stuff like this in the vault too, which you guys looked at yesterday. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, well, and this is something too, where it's like, we have all this stuff, but unfortunately, because it's not super well organized, it's not, it can't necessarily be helpful to everybody, but it's more like a, if someone wants to volunteer or you know, spend some time looking at stuff for us and identifying things that's really helpful. There's just so much stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, they just had truckloads of blueprints, or excuse me, like blueprint cabinets and file cabinets just like dropped off after the plant had closed. And then for years after that too, like they would go down to where Agco had various storage spaces a lot of the time in um, Kansas City, I think, and just pick up like file cabinets basically and bring them back up here so we just have like too much stuff to deal with basically and then they just get plopped into a room like this which is just like situated i don't know why they got put in this room you know because then our clothing is on the other side of this and it's not easy to access either like the vault's on the first floor and it's easy to get to but then like this room is like just a mess also but we have so much stuff in here well, I know from I, know. <laughs> I know from the story that I was told when the whole thing went down, they literally got a phone call from Agco or whoever mm -hmm. it was at the time that said, "This is what's happening. You have X amount of days yeah. to come get this stuff, or we're getting rid of it." Yeah. So basically, I think they ended up with like eleven semi trailers sent to all the different locations, and it just 
and then it got back here it just got shoved wherever it would fit and yeah. hence why there's stuff here downstairs yeah. everywhere exactly so but and, yeah these are all heart par and maybe some oliver too and there's more blueprints in that file cabinet also but there's um there's blueprints for at least, other various things too in town. At least hopefully they're somewhat organized like what it's like 1920 no, or there. These just, aren't those don't represent so that, that what's doesn't, in there anymore. Okay, so. <laughs> no, unfortunately I think maybe at one point they were better organized, but through the years somehow they've become less organized. But I mean like look look at how many there are. But they're just so thin. So when people do call us, we could come look through these drawers but we just don't really want to because they're so thin and we don't want to deal with that so we're going to scan them all instead it doesn't even feel like normal paper it's like no because it, it's, it's like parchment it's like blueprint paper they used back then but i mean this is over 100 years old like that's 1913 it's all stained and stuff but someone could use it so the hope is that we're going to make them more usable by scanning everything no that's it definitely <laughs> do you know a lot of people who are into heart bars Unfortunately, that generation is kind of dying off. Well, A, to be into the heart par stuff, you have to have money to deal with that stuff. Mm. Not only because it's expensive to buy the tractors, but when you do find them, You'd have to generally, generally parts, guys are like buying rolling frames and finding parts to build a tractor out of multiple. And it just... Plus, the generation that was into the prairie tractors and that older stuff is kind of dying off. And now the the new upcoming thing in the antique tractor hobby is like the, what we call what we refer to as the muscle tractor era. So, like mm. the late 60s, yeah, early 70s. The so, ones. there is still interest in that stuff. It's just more of a higher class clientele, if you want to put okay. it that way. <laughs> I think the hard parts are just neat because they're older, but yeah we have a little bit more hard part stuff in the library where i grab these keys if you want to see that just because it's kind of neat and cool it's not so much blueprints and stuff but we have these old ledger books and things if you want to yeah. look at them ledger books and documentation from heart par and these are you can see it's that september 1912 to january 1913 and it's just it's not so much tractor related it's more so like what went on at the plant and like um supplies and stuff like that that they needed to purchase but and also that's what these big ones are up here um the manual room that you were in with scott um yesterday those were in there before but we just put the and then these were in the library so we just put them all together they're just i don't know they just have lots of kind of random documentation of like financial records basically which is just kind of neat so if you know, this would be more kind of like company research related stuff, but even these were not super, they're not like super helpful, but they do have kind of, I don't know, just kind of random. Yeah, just general day-to-day, -day, yeah. in and out, finance, keeping track. Yeah, exactly. And the fact, I mean, they don't bind books like that anymore. No. They're just just the binding itself is yeah over the top. Yeah. Awesome. Well, these ones too are so big, you know, so. It's pretty, it's pretty neat. We have other kind of random, this stuff is similar to just like the binders and stuff we have in the tractor room where we don't even really open it up a whole lot. And, but it's just kind of data. Bill of engineering department. So this is like primer, sealant, antifreeze. I think it's just kind of sales, sales orders. Well, it's they, bill, well, it's a bill of material, so. And they got part numbers. If those part numbers, like the three zero part number, that'd still be somewhat current. I've never seen a five dash part number before, but that might. It just might be, be an S. Yeah, it could I be. I think it's an S because it looks like that. And that, an since S. it just says adhesive, that could have just been like a bin location type thing for them to go find it. Mm -hmm. It sucks that it doesn't have like a specific project related to it. Well, and these are cut off, too, so I'm not really... I don't know who made these binders, because they're obviously copies of stuff. But it would be interesting, since it's engineering department, it would be interesting to know if these, if this was a pick, a pick list for a certain project they're working on. Mm -hmm. But, yeah, that... And Is there a date on it? No. It was probably over here in the corner well, somewhere. Well, you could have written date here, but nobody did. <laughs> oh, wait a minute here. Model... So 
see it's where you'd have to know what that meant because they do have a model mm -hmm. but that's nothing that looks familiar oh wait no right there 2105 with pod cab mm -hmm. so i wonder a style sheet three of eight so I wonder if like sheet three of eight, so if there was eight sheets for a 2105, at least a certain part of it, and those were all the parts that you needed to pick mm -hmm. to build that part of a 2105. I bet that's what that is. Yeah. Well, and also one of the guys who worked at the plant, if you really wanted to know, we could bring one of these down and have him look at it too, you know? We do a lot of just calling Dean and being like, hey, what's this? So, <laughs> but yeah, so that's just... The heart power all of our collections just kind of all over the place in the museum, basically. So, because now we're in the library, but then there's you know th two rooms fully dedicated to it. That weird room over there, it's just kind of all over. So yeah, interesting. And we got Scott's name yesterday. What's I'm McKenna. I'm the director for the museum. So, but both of us do in terms of like servicing people who collect tractors we do all the same kind of stuff so scott and i i mean so if you call the museum chances are you're gonna get one of them two on the phone it's just the two of us or sometimes on fridays we have a volunteer at the front desk but then you we pick up the phone after that so <laughs> yep so i think that uh actually does take care of everything this time mm -hmm. yes. as far as we know so yeah <laughs> i mean these are kind of fringe stuff anyway so it's all it's all things that once everything gets sorted out and all the pieces of the puzzle get put together, it's all going to start coming together. So Yeah, well, and it's all being preserved. So, you know, the history's alive still. <laughs> so, all right. Okay. Well, thanks for showing us this. No worries. Okay, so initially I had finished this video out in Iowa. But, uh, actually, I finished this video three times. But, um... Seems like every day I learned a little bit more information that was relevant. And the last little tidbit I learned on the last day we were out there and I didn't have time to go back to the museum to actually make a vid make a clip at the museum to finish this video. So, try to keep this short because this video has already gotten pretty long. But I want to make sure that I cover everything that I need to cover relevant to help the museum out the best I can. So, um, there are... Well, first and foremost, if you live close enough to be of any assistance, the museum always needs volunteers, especially for the archive project. Both, well, actually, both for the archive project and for the corporate tractor project, they need volunteers. Um, and with the corporate tractor project, especially, they need skilled workmen. You know, sheet metal. They need people that can door close. They need people that can do sheet metal work, mechanical work. You know, stuff like that. But for the corporate or for the archive project, if you can just pull papers out of a folder and look at it and catalog stuff, they, that'd be great. Um, so if you want to call the museum, figure out when they might be doing volunteer events or if you can just come in for an hour or whatever and work on a box or whatever. But uh, McKenna, the museum director, call, get a hold of her if you feel like if you're close enough and can volunteer. By all means, get a hold of them and see what you can do to volunteer. Um, as far as fundraising, they got actually four main projects. They have the archive project, which obviously takes money. They have the corporate tractor project, which obviously takes money. They have general museum operational costs. And then what I found out the last day, and I have to verify that this is still an active fundraising event, but with the amount of money that they have collected so far, I have to believe it is. There is actually a project in progress, but they kind of hit a dead end because their fundraising kind of stalled out to add another wing onto whatever side of the, the opposite side of the museum that the tractor wing is currently on, whatever that would end up being. I get all turned around out there as far as west, north, south, east, or west, but anyway. They're adding, or they have plans, and they have done a major part of the fundraising already to build another wing onto the museum 
to add more tractor storage because they have been getting tractor pledges somebody passes away or runs across a unique piece of equipment or whatever they've been running across people that want to pledge tractors to the museum to become the permanent caretakers of but they don't have enough room to store them um the 4325 for example that's pledged the museum it won't even go through the door that's currently there um they estimated that uh, it was going to take, well, they, they had produ or they had a cost to build plus cost to operate it added on. They were figuring they needed about $1.5 million. It was going to be about a million to put the expansion on itself. Um, and Dean, who we will meet in a later video, um, who is kind of, there's two guys in kind of take up, taking up the corporate tractor project as far as leading it. And Dean is one of them, and then there's a gentleman named Wayne. I'm going to try to leave last names out of this to protect the innocent, but we'll meet Dean later. Hopefully we can meet Wayne at some point, but it wasn't on this trip. Um, they, but Dean got about 750000 raised before his fundraising kind of stalled out. Um, so they're almost there. They, 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 they at the time they initially quoted it, which he didn't say how long, how long ago it was, they needed a million to put the expansion on. So another 250,000 would build the expansion and then they added on some extra cost to run the expansion. They kind of, they wanted to pad it so that they had operating costs covered as well. Um, I guess the Moline collectors um, ponied up a bunch of money for it, plus they've done some of their own fundraising because Moline want, the Moline guys want to take, have a bigger part in that museum as well. But, uh, so those are their four major fundraisings um, that they have that they have going on as the archive project, that museum expansion, the corporate tractor, and then a general fund. Um, well, the corporate tractor project, I, again, talked to Dean about it, and he actually talked about it a little in the video that we're gonna meet him in. It'll probably be one of the last ones you'll see. Um, the corporate tractor project, their goal with it, mostly due to money, is they want it to be a complete, physically looking like the tractor that it look, should look like. Um, Dean told me that they have enough prints and stuff that there is no reason why it couldn't be made into a running tractor, but they would need a lot of money to make it happen. So, that's kind of the story on the corporate tractor. If I, I, I think we did talk about that on video, which you will see at a later date, but I wanted all this on the museum video so that you know what they need. Um, you can, if you do call in, or if you do send them a donation, a check or whatever, you can specify what you want the money to be spent on. Um, all you have to do is put a note in with whatever you're sending for a donation and say, I want it to go to the archive project or I want it to go to the corporate tractor or I want it split up so many ways. Um, I, think, I think I'm going to send them a $300 check and say I want $100 toward the expansion, $100 toward the corporate tractor, and $100 toward the archive project. And hopefully I can make it a yearly a, a donation I make enough through the channel and everything. I should be able to swing 300 bucks a year. Um, so I'm, I'm planning on making that one my yearly donation to it. Um, so uh, you can get on Floyd County Museum's Facebook page. All their contact information is on there. I will put a link to their web page in the video description. I will also put a link to the master list of all the manuals they have available in the video description. Um, but don't forget all the other stuff that they have that Scott talked about that they don't necessarily, they have cataloged, but they don't necessarily have an online list yet. So all of the defect lists for the Fiats, all the defect lists for the 585 Molines, all the blueprints, all the microfish, build cards, manuals, technical information, all that stuff is out there. You just have to call and ask about it. Um, and as soon as I know that videos are available, I will let you guys know videos are available and then because I'm not going to buy videos and then turn around and publish them on eBay or on not eBay. I publish them on YouTube for everybody to watch for free. It took money to get those videos digitized. It takes money to maintain the collection. That's how they make their money is selling that stuff. It's a big chunk of their operating budget. 
So I'm not going to buy them and then turn around and put them on YouTube and take that away from them. Um, if you want them and you want to see the museum succeed and continue to advance the archive project, buy them and watch them yourselves because that's, that's fair to the museum. So when I know about it, I'll let you guys know about it. Um, I think that's everything I need to cover. I'm sure there will be more that I remember later, but that covers the main part of it. So, volunteers, donations, that should take care of it. So, hopefully doing this video sees them, sees, gets them a little bit of business. I don't know, we'll see how things go. Um, so anyway, with that being said, that's it for this one. We'll catch you guys on the next one.